This is lecture three. In this lecture, we'll be discussing social cognition, and we'll start off by talking about how knowledge is structured in our brain. But let's first look further into the concept of social cognition. With social co cognition, we refer to the ways in which uh, people think about themselves and the social world around them. Specifically, we look into how people select information, interpret information, remember it, and also use social information to make judgments and decisions. And that's, of course, very important in our endeavor to try to understand human beings better. So our brains are very complex. We have a lot of knowledge. And luckily for us, there are smart systems that we use in the brain uh, that we can rely on when we make social decisions. So uh, one part of these, uh, these systems is called schemas. And with, with schemas, uh, we refer to the way uh, in which our knowledge is structured in the brain. So schemas are mental structures that sort of organize this knowledge about a specific topic. Uh, for example, uh, all the information that we have about our colleagues, about our family, about our friends, but also about completely different topics like hurricanes, uh, like your favorite uh, soda, uh, like your favorite breakfast. So all these different parts of, of uh, 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 different topics have a specific structure in their brain, and this is, uh, this is sort of um, uh, all captured in a certain schema. So all the information on a certain uh, topic. Um, so you can imagine how many schemas we have in our brains. There are so many different uh, parts uh, of information that we know a lot about. Um, and luckily for us, these schemas are not always activated. That would be exhausting if you would uh, all the time think about all the information that you have in our brain. So these schemas are sometimes activated and sometimes they aren't. And it's important to understand when these schemas are activated because the moment they get activated and that part of the brain with a specific type of knowledge is active, it starts to impact your decision making. So it's really important for us to know how these schemas become active and what happens once they become active. So um, in the first, uh, if, if you try to understand when schemas get activated, it's important to realize that some sch uh, schemas are always accessible. They are always active. This is called cro chronic accessibility. And this is, for example, about knowledge that is very important to you. For example, knowledge about yourself. In lecture uh, uh, five, we're going to extensively talk about the self. And uh, we will see that all the knowledge that we have about ourselves is basically always activated. And that is because we are very important to ourselves. So everything we know about um, you yeah, that, that will impact you. And, and, and if you hear information about yourself, it will be automatically uh, uh, influencing your uh, behavior. But also about other topics that are really important to you. For example, information about your family. That's also very important for you. And, and therefore, uh, the concept of family or certain family members that you are very close to or your best friends, that, that information is always uh, accessible as well. Um, interestingly enough, one part uh, of information that, always, that also becomes easily accessible is when we try to suppress a thought, which is somehow a little bit ironic. So the moment that we are very interested in forgetting something, for example, I think we can all relate to the feeling that you're lying in bed and maybe you're worrying about an upcoming exam that you have and you're, you're lying in bed and you only think to yourself, I need to stop worrying because I need to rest in order to do this exam well. So you tell yourself, stop thinking about the exam. Stop thinking about the exam. Does it help? Probably not. And that is because the moment we try to suppress thoughts, this is very effortful. And especially if we're tired, we have a very hard time doing so. And ironically, these uh, thoughts that you try to suppress become highly accessible, very active. So this is some, a little bit ironic. So the moment you try to stop yourself from thinking about something, actually that knowledge becomes more accessible. And this has also been studied in, in I think, a very smart and funny way. I'm going to do this, this very short test with you now. So I'm going to give you an assignment. You can think of everything you want to think about. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. You can think about whatever you want, except for a white beer, like a polar beer or any white beer. You cannot think about it. So for the next 10 seconds, think about anything you want, but not about a white beer. Don't forget, don't think about the white beer. Are you doing it? Don't think about it, huh? Don't do it. 
Yeah, that's very difficult. So this has actually been coined the white bear effect because in research on sp as exactly this, uh, this uh, assignment, it turned out that people had a very hard time resisting thoughts of a white bear, even though they never think about a white bear. What, when do you ever think about a white bear? Unless when you're visiting the zoo, maybe, or you're watching a documentary. But yeah, this, this is not a topic that you think about a lot. So it's interesting that something that is not relevant for you, uh, that is not you know, important to you at all, and you rarely think about it, the moment you cannot think about it, it becomes uh, more active. And that's also when it's very difficult if, for example, you're in a family gathering and before you go to the meeting and you enter the room with all your aunts and, 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 and uncles and your mom says to you, Whatever you do, don't bring up the divorce with your aunt. It's a very sensitive topic, so don't talk about the divorce. Uh, that's impossible. So trying to suppress thoughts is really difficult, and that actually leads to chronic accessibility. So some of these schemas are chronically accessible, also when we try to suppress them, but most schemas are actually temporarily accessible, and this is called uh, priming. So priming uh, means the temporary activation of certain knowledge. So some topics just become more relevant at a certain point in time than others. Um, and this happened, for example, uh, a year ago when my uh, oldest son, he really wanted to have a dog. And he talked about it all the time. And when we were out and we were wa walking around and all the time he said, look mom, there's a dog, there's a dog, so, there's a dog. So everywhere we went, he saw dogs. And it, it seemed like the, the whole world was just overpopulated with dogs because this concept of dogs was temporarily active uh, for him. And he pointed out that everywhere he looked, he saw dogs. And that is because once the schema is activated, we become highly uh, 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 susceptible for information that's related to the schema. So you just see more dogs when you're really preoccupied with that topic. Just like when I was pregnant, I saw pregnant women all over where I, where I was looking, I saw pregnant women. It seemed like there were more pregnant women than ever. That's not the case, but that's just the way our brain works. So when something is, is really important to you and you're preoccupied with it temporarily, then it, this is also steering um, your perception of the world. And a last example, so my, my parents are actually uh, contemplating uh, buying a minivan or uh, uh, maybe a, uh, a camper. And uh, when they did so, they, they told me that uh, everywhere they looked, they saw, they saw campers uh, on the street. And uh, uh, it, it was just the way that they were perceiving their social world. So the schemas that are activated for you uh, also impact the way you're looking at the world. And this concept of priming has a very big allure also for researchers. It's a very cool concept, if you think about it, that, that our temporary activation of knowledge is steering the way we look at the world, but also how we make decisions. And um, in somewhere between 2000 and 2010, there was a lot of research on this, for example, by John Barch, uh, who did, a, I think, a very cool study in which um, he uh, studied uh, priming as well. And the task was as followed. He asked participants um, to, uh, to uh, look at a number of words, and there were two different groups. So this is an experiment. Uh, two different groups. People were randomly assigned to the groups. And for one group of participants, they just saw random words on the screen, so not related to any specific schema. Uh, the other group saw words that were related to the concept of elderly, like gray, wrinkle, bingo, all the words that sort of activate, temporarily activate the schema elderly. And he was interested whether this, this priming also impacted their, their behavior. So what he did next after... Uh, the participants uh, had this manipulation, this priming, um, he asked them to go to another room. And um, he said, so the next part of the experiment is in another room. And he uh, uh, actually, the, 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 the next part of the experiment was not in the other room. It was uh, the, the walk they had, so how long it took for them for, to walk from, from, from one room to um, uh, the elevator that they needed to go to to go to, this, to the other room. So uh, he sort of, uh, uh, um, with a, uh, a stopwatch, he measured how long it took participants to walk to the elevator. And his idea was, if the concept of elderly is activated, maybe this sort of unconsciously also impacts your behavior, and maybe you start you know, behaving more like an elderly as well, meaning that you might walk to the uh, elevator slower compared to when this schema is not activated. 
Pretty smart, huh? So that was what he did, and he found that indeed, group number two, primed with the concept of elderly, walked to the elevator slower. This, this, this study had a huge impact in the field. It was very clever. People liked it a lot. It was also wrote about a lot. But recently, we found out that this study is actually not as solid as uh, Bar John Barch uh, yeah, thought uh, when he ran the study, because this study failed to replicate. So this means that this study was actually repeated with a bigger sample size, so actually a better study with better methods, and these results were not found again. Which does not mean that the concept of priming is not real. It is definitely real. But... Uh, in this specific context, it's not working the way that John Barch uh, thought it would. So you're not starting to walk slower if you think about the concept of elderly. Okay, let's look at another example. Another study also executed by John Barch, who really loved the topic of priming. And this is actually something that's also discussed in your book, this, uh, this study. So um, again, concept of priming. So what he did was he gave participants a cup. And this cup was either warm or it was cold, so either like a warm cup of coffee or a, 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 a cup of, uh, of with ice cold water or a soda drink. And then he asked participants to uh, 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 look at a certain person, someone he didn't know yet, and uh, gave an impression of the personality of that stranger, of that person he didn't know. And uh, John Bart saw that maybe if you're holding a warm cup of coffee and you're looking at a stranger, maybe you also think that this person has a warm personality. So you might actually like a person more, think this person is more friendly when you're holding a warm cup of coffee versus a cold uh, cup of water or another drink. So that was his idea. And indeed, he found that there was a difference uh, between um, these two groups, also discussed in the book. However, recently, again, this specific study was executed again. It was repeated with a bigger sample size, better methods, and failed to replicate again. And I'm mentioning this also to note how quickly our field is changing, and that some studies that are actually discussed in the book failed the replication test. So it's important to pay attention and watch these lectures so I can update you on when, when this uh, is the case. Um, still, even though these studies that became very famous uh, failed to replicate, this whole concept of priming is very popular. This idea is very popular, also not only amongst researchers, but also amongst uh, marketeers. Uh, so, for example, you're probably familiar with the concept product placement, and that means that when you're, for example, watching TV, watching video clips, like you see over here, you see a still of a video clip from Lady Gaga, in which she has cans of Diet Coke rolled in, in her hair, uh, which is actually marketing, it's, it's a very smart way of uh, Diet Coke, Coca-Cola to uh, um, prime their brand uh, while you're watching a video clip. Uh, and of course, this is a sort of subtle way of, of advertising uh, Diet Coke. Uh, also, this, this product placement is happening all the time, also in movies, for example, uh, where here you see a bag of Dorito chips. Uh, and there was actually, I think, a, a, a cool ex uh, example of product placement in 2010, uh, when the, the uh, final of the World Cup, Soccer World Cup, was... Um, in which uh, Spain won, and I think for people living in the Netherlands, we probably have not a lot of memory or not a lot of active memory on this, uh, 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 this final because uh, we lost, the Netherlands lost again in the final against Spain, so it was very traumatizing. So don't forget about the soccer and forget about the outcome, but, but focus on the product placement because here you see, I think, one of the most stunning acts of product placement in the history, uh, which is uh, this, uh, the, the FIFA trophy was actually presented um, on the pitch on a, in a Louis Vuitton travel case, which also became very, uh, uh, very popular uh, then. So it's a, a smart way for Louis Vuitton to also make uh, uh, sort of, this is uh, the way uh, in which the biggest trophy in the world uh, is carried in this uh, specific uh, suitcase. So product placement priming, very popular concept. So um, researchers study it, market marketeers love it, but uh, priming happens all the time, even uh, for, you know, if you're just talking to random people. Um, so we are primed with, with products when we go about our world, but we're also primed with 
people and with ideas all day, every day. Um, so let's imagine that you uh, uh, work in a company and you know that you're going to have a new boss. This new boss is coming in to work. And then you're asking around to other people, asking like, do you know this person? I don't know him. Uh, do you think he's, he's going to be a good boss? And then one of your you know, acquaintances, not, not a close friend, but someone you just know, comes up to you and says to you, you know what, I know that you're, you're going to have this new boss, and I heard rumors that he is not a nice person at all. He's very dominant, he has a very directive and sort of merciless leadership style, so this is really going to be very tough for you. So um, you hear this from someone, which is actually also priming. So you, you, this, this whole concept of someone, uh, a nasty boss, someone that's not going to be positive and not going to have a positive impact in your work field, that's going to be activated. Um, and you're going to walk around with this idea. And we know from research that if, you, if this type of knowledge is activated and, and, and inserted in memory, it's very persistent. So this idea, this initial conception of a person being a bully or being a, a bad boss, this is probably going to persist even when you hear later that this rumor was completely false. So we are actually very bad as human beings. We are very good at incorporating information and, and, and uh, uh, placing people in categories, bad boss, good boss. But once we have this social categorization process completed, it's very hard for us to change the ideas. So even when we hear later, and this acquaintance comes up to you again and says, okay, you need to completely forget about what I said to you because I was actually talking about someone else. Then still this belief persists, and this is called the perseverance effect or belief perseverance. So uh, when then later on, this new boss comes actually into the office, and maybe you don't immediately have a meeting with the boss, but you're just going to watch, watch the behavior, and you watch him talk to specific uh, people, Maybe you see this boss having an interaction with the secretary and maybe raising his voice a little bit and saying, well, this really needs to be dealt with. This really needs to be, you know, uh, changed and, and, and improved. And this is in line with your idea. So you already have this idea. This boss is going to be a bully. It's going to be a bad boss. And then you're going to be on the lookout for examples that you're actually correct. This is called confirmation bias. This concept is really important. So we're going to come back to this concept a lot. So if you don't immediately grasp it, it's not a problem. But just for, for now, uh, let's keep in mind that the moment that we uh, hear a concept, when we have a certain idea what a, what a person is like, we're going to look for cues that our uh, uh, initial idea is correct. So we're going to pay specific attention when this boss is indeed uh, maybe uh, reacting in a bit of a dominant way. When later on you see this boss, for example, interacting with your colleague, making a laugh, being very friendly, being very warm, you're probably going to ignore it. That's also how our brain works. So if we see contradictory information, we're just not really paying attention because this is not in line with our concept. This is not in line with our idea. So in this way, we are looking for confirmation of our pre-existing beliefs. So then maybe there comes a moment that you actually have a meeting with your new boss. You had this idea that it was a bully. You went on the lookout to search for cues that this boss was indeed not friendly. And then you have a meeting. How are you going to come into the meeting? Are you going to be very open? Are you going to be vulnerable and friendly? Probably not, right? So you're probably also going to change your behavior in line with your pre-existing beliefs. So maybe you're going to be a bit cold. Maybe you're going to be a bit distant. Maybe even also a little bit unfriendly already. And what happens then is that your new boss is going to respond. So you're not, your new boss is going to respond in an unfriendly way because you are unfriendly. And this is called a self-fulfilling prophecy. So all these initial ideas we have about people set in motion our perception. We're going to look for information that's in line with the ideas. And it's also impacting our behavior. So we're actually also behaving in a way which makes it more likely for our initial ideas to be confirmed. Self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, so this basically means that our expectations trigger behavior. And let's imagine you never heard the gossip in the beginning. You never did so, and you were fully open-minded, and probably you would have an entirely different meeting with this new boss. You would have given him a chance, and you might ha actually have a very uh, uh, cooperative and, and productive uh, work uh, relationship with him. 
So um, it's important to really understand, because this is at the core of, of how our social interactions work. Expectations do a lot. And uh, one of the consequences of uh, this whole process is uh, that stereotypes and prejudice also remains in the same way. So here you see the world, according to Donald Trump in 2016, when he was uh, still uh, you know, powerful in the world, uh, still uh, pretty much is, but uh, here you see uh, his stereotypical beliefs of people around the globe. So you see some terrorists, you see the Miss Universe farm, you see Trump world. So this is basically how the world, uh, the schemas of uh, people in different uh, uh, parts of the world according to Donald Trump. So this, these are his pre-existing beliefs. He's also, of course, gonna be on the lookout for behavior of these people in different groups that is in line with his initial ideas. So if you have a certain prejudice against people, if you have stereotypical beliefs about people from certain countries, certain groups, this is gonna steer your perception. It's gonna steer your interpretation of their behavior. And in the case of Donald Trump, he actually became in a position of power and it also steered his behavior. So he started to show immediately when he uh, ran office and he became um, uh, uh, the president of the United States, he showed discriminatory behavior immediately at the very start of uh, when he uh, became president. Um, he uh, set in motion a temporary ban uh, on Muslims basically entering the United States. So uh, this uh, was for people from uh, several countries like people from Iraq, Iran, uh, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria. They were all banned from the US um, and this he sort of sold this as a temporary ban, but actually this ban stayed in place the entire time when he was president, um, which is, of course, just a mere discriminatory uh, behavior. So he discriminated against people from Muslim countries, which is because he had these pre-existing ideas, his prejudice and stereotyping. Um, I think, luckily, for the people from these countries and also just for uh, sort of uh, human dignity and, and justice, uh, this ban is now reversed. This was actually the first uh, act of the new president, Biden, when he was installed. He reversed this act, so this is not going on anymore. Um, and we'll be talking more about the topic of stereotyping, discrimination, and uh, um, prejudice in, uh, in lecture 13. So more to come, uh, and this is all for now. Thanks. <laughs>